met once in my life, this time in this poem, uh, is, it recounts the tale. I was in the Marine Corps at the time, and I had orders overseas. That's really all you need to know. You should know, however, yeah, in addition to that, that he had been a conscientious objector during World War II. Okay? And of course, he was very active against the war in Vietnam uh, in 1969 when this poem is set. C.O. In Memoriam of the Gold. <clears throat> Cold scrambled eggs, burnt bacon curling under his slightly cockeyed glasses, opera on the stereo, the bay ice flat and gray as a naval deck, the shore rimy and swirling with snow, gusts rising up to us, a window rattling behind his, I can breathe out here. A Sunday in November 1969, the morning after, Trinity Square mounted his Old Glory trilogy. Bloody Mary toasts with celery stick swizzles, Worcestershire, horseradish, and fiery talk about the Narragansetts and the Colonials who were slavers. To the sun porch beaming with poets, I carry with me a shadowy prosaic orders to Vietnam, a green lieutenant, shave-headed as a monk, I leave tomorrow and cannot fathom Lowell's question about the green bah rays, his breath chopping the word into hardly intelligible halves. He takes over and pictures the pajamaed gorilla flying out the rear hatch of the helicopter. He asks me if I have seen this, and he assumes I know more than I am saying. Me, now the dim, lumpen, and enemy soldier, pleading innocence, ignorance, dismay. It is as if a vacuum had sucked up the straight talk, and under his affronted glare I feel like Hawthorne's young Robin Molyneux, bewildered by Boston's mocking, checker-faced hostility. I, too, am blistered by the moment and can't believe this is happening. The china clinks, and talk slowly resumes while I come to, blinking like a hammered calf. I hardly know the abbreviation CO, but a conscience must be at work when he leans over and whispers, come back, intact, rhyme nearly full, the order's fully meant. Thank you. Okay, quiz time. What was the word? Thank you very much. <laughs> now, I want to pause for a second of joy before I do all of the misery of my poems. Um, uh, a moment of joy. Actually, you're a beautiful child. I was thinking I should read odes all night long so that yay would be the only response, right? Um, um, uh, I want to do a yay and clap um, for Karen Lenier and Barbara Goldberg who are in the audience uh, tonight. Uh, they are from Woodworks, and this book that I just read CO from is from Tipping Point and was my first book of poetry and was um, um, probably the most important rite of passage in my life. Mm -hmm. I, actually, I think one or two of them. <laughs> just, just to sort of, yeah, poetic passage. Thank you. I knew I was missing something. I was going to get killed for remembering that. You know, I really would get killed for that. Uh, but, but I can tell you, I, as I was reading CO, I can remember almost every word of, of um, serious investigation with Barbara. You know, we met for hours over this book, more than once, and every single word was uh, tugged at and, and, um, and tapped to see if it was you know, going to hold up. Um, so, thank you, Karen. Thank you, Barbara. What is the nice thing in that poem that I realized as I read it is that it actually does connect with one of the early poems I wanted to read tonight. Um, this is from The Looking House, and um, it's a long poem, so, you know, enjoy, settle in, whatever, okay? It's not that long, but it's long enough. It's called Arden the Morrow, which is the name of a house, and it's one of 
it's the beginning of the book, and it's one of the looking houses in this book. Um, the, the background of the poem really is this, that I had spent two years in the Marine Corps as a lieutenant. I wasn't in Vietnam, I was in Okinawa. I left as a conscientious objector. But after the war, I, after I got out, I was sort of a blotto. My brain wasn't working right. You know, that the sense that, that, that somehow you make a decision about war, that somehow it's all settled in your head, is, you know, was not the case for me. One had, I had to go sort of figure things out. And it took a long while. In fact, I ended up in Ireland for that summer of the year afterwards. And this is where this poem uh, occurs. Ardnamara. <coughs> Catherine and John said it meant beside the sea. I thought it meant above. Because the house was above a pasture swooping down to the tide, a 30-foot drop. It stepped through layers of grass and manure smell to the red leathery weed splashed across the rocks. And then, looking up, you'd feel dwarfed by the one wall left standing, a fragment of Sweeney's castle, just a stone wing blade. But you got the idea, fortress, and the fear of raids. Later, when I first read the opening of the Agamemnon, I thought the Greek signal fires must have been lit on points like this. The war won, but not over. The flames a signal to begin learning the next thing to dread. The Dobbins, long ago, had turned the hayloft into a room to let. There was a shred of linoleum, a cot with spring, and a low sink, a kind to bathe a baby in. Knives, forks, butane, and windows on three walls. A red door with a latch opened onto cement stairs leading down to a toilet in the barn. Me, pissing with the cows, those enormous, contented breathers. I spread a sleeping bag on the cot and slept at an angle so I could look out to the point. I had a Hermes rocket to type on. The war in Vietnam still ongoing, but I was well out of it, as far as I could get. I went in to Donegal once a week for newspapers and wine gums. For rent, I helped John milk the cows and tend to the hay all through the summer. In return, I got the earliest hours of the day. And during storms, the whole afternoon free. I stayed put tried not to leave the farm. I never saw the ruins of, the, of a chapel in the next pasture over, and only now have I learned that a 6th century monk named A had made his cell in the crawl space there. Now there are metal roadside markers and a guidebook to his gravestone, an upright bolt of granite as tall as I am, rough-hewn, rounded, mossy, and chiseled smooth in front. At the top, like a halo, an incised long-armed Maltese cross in a wide circling rim. A sign, the book says, of an art in transition. A pagan monolith crowned with Christian radiance. To the right and below the wheel are three sides of symbol of the Trinity, a weave that makes me imagine A's bones, the arms and legs folded neatly over one another. I stand above him in the midday quiet and remember how deeply I resented the cars that sometimes sped by on their way west. I stirred as little as I could, sought out no one. I loved the sweet silence of hay as it cured, and the labor too the mowing and tossing, letting grass breathe itself dry. Even the raucous, oily baler, an old engine,